Okay, guys, we're live. I'm going to give it a few seconds just to make sure everyone can get on. Let's see here. All right, we're live. Okay, give it a few seconds. Give it a second. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and start. Looks like we got a few people on now. Um, all right. Okay. What's up, San Antonio and world? I'm Dr. Kasim Bhatt, and I'm a kidney doctor. I'm here to break down health in a simple way. And welcome to round three of Disrupting Kidney Care. It's my webinar series we do about kidney care. And the first two uh, series actually concentrated on uh, value-based medicine. This one is going to hear, is here to answer the question, is home dialysis the answer? Okay. I, the reason why I'm posing that question is because um, this is one of the biggest pushes in Medicare right now. Medicare insurance companies, value-based medicine companies, they're all pushing more home dialysis. Uh, and quite honestly, this is the, the, this is the, this is kind of the reality of healthcare as a whole, taking healthcare home. But is this the best solution for everybody? And is this the right answer for all, um, for everybody? Now, to answer that, we got an all-star panel of guests here. Now, if you're a doctor, just guess what? If you're a doctor, you can actually get CME credits, continuing med med medical education credits for this. Um, you, all you have to do is go to my website, Your Kidneys, Your Health, and you can actually get a free CME for this, okay? Now, um, do me a favor. If you're here right now, do me a favor, press that like button. Press that like button, like and share. Also, in that comment section, tell me who you are, what's your relationship to kidney care, and why you're here, Okay. Um, are you a doctor? Are you a nurse? Are you uh, in the business community? Are you a patient? Let me know why you're here. Okay. Now, uh, to get uh, now to get it started, um, like kid, when it comes to kidney care, right? Kidney uh, kidney disease patients go through five stages. One through five. Five being the worst. When they hit stage five, um, less than fifteen percent is when they need dialysis. And there's typically three types of dialysis: in center hemodialysis, home hemodialysis, and peritoneal dialysis. Now. To put, this in, uh, to put this in perspective, I'm going to address it in this way. We're going to talk about the patient experience, right? So in, in the tech community, they talk about the user experience. In, the, in, in the, the business community, they talk about the customer experience. But in healthcare, we rarely address this. We rarely address what the patient experience is. So I'm going to kind of go it from that angle, okay? Now, as far as the patient experience, when you have in-center hemodialysis, you go to a center, you leave your house, and you go to a center three times a week. Um, each session is four hours. Okay. You go there for three times a week for four hours. It's either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And what they do is they take the blood out of you, put it in a machine, clean it for you, then return it back to you. Okay. Three times a week, four hours each session. Needles are either placed in your arm through a fistula of graft, or you have a catheter in your neck. And I'm about to show you those catheters and, and, uh, uh, and fistulas and grafts. Okay. And this is what a center will look like. Oftentimes it can be a freestanding unit, but sometimes it's in a shopping center. It's in a business park. You can see them all over. Okay. But this is where our patients go to when they need dialysis. You can see there, that's the machine they have um, there. Um, it's, uh, and th there's a chair they sit in and the chairs are lined. It could be, uh, you know, 10, 15 across. This is what an access will look like. That that arm right there, that's a fistula. That's your own vein. Okay, that's a natural vein. It's just been artificially created into a fistula where you have high flow in there. Again, two needles go in there: one to take the blood out of you, one to put the blood back in after it's been cleaned. If you don't have room, if you don't have a good enough vein, they put a graft in there, a synthetic tube. You can see that white circular um, uh, tube there. That's actually a graft. Okay. Now. <clears throat> If um, fistula is the number one option, graft is the number two option, the last option is typically that right there, a catheter. A catheter is a tube that goes in your neck. It comes out the chest, but it actually goes in your neck vein and drops down below your heart. That is the worst solution for most people, okay? It leads to infection, have all sorts of issues, and people who have that catheter um, typically don't live as long as well. So that's the last option we want to have on board for, for a patient. Now, the patient, the in-center experience, guess what? You know, we talk about value-based medicine, right? Everyone's talking about clinical care team, clinical care coordination. But guess what? For dec decades now, these, these patients actually had a clinical care team. We could talk about the efficiency of that clinical care team, but they've had one. They've had a dialysis tech that actually sticks those fistulas. You have a nurse that's in charge of that Dallas, uh, the, the dialysis unit and those, and those techs and, and patients. You have a dietitian there to discuss diet. You have a social worker that handles all insurance-related issues. You got to remember... 
the insurance and uh, uh, with uh, with the dialysis, Medicare is involved. You oftentimes need a secondary payer. You need to have commercial payers. You have all these issues that's so difficult for a patient to navigate. So if they have a social worker, and those social workers, social workers can also handle transportation issues. Now, the doctor on dialysis, the nephrologist, will oftentimes see you four times a month. Okay, they will see you four times a month. Now, home hemodialysis. Home hemodialysis is a new one. You can see there that man right there has a mach smaller machine in his living room. It occurs about five times a week, four to five times a week. Each session is two to two and a half hours. Blood runs through an artificial filter, just like we said, fish to graft involved, the whole nine. Best thing about it, though, is that there's more flexibility and more autonomy. Because you're doing it, say, four or five times a week, you can pick your days. You can say, I want to do this two and a half hour session after work or before work, before after dinner, before dinner, whenever you want to do it. Now, sometimes you do need to have a caregiver at home to help with that. OK, um, because oftentimes with the blood running through the machine, they're scared about low blood pressure and all such issues. OK. Now, um, these are kind of the machines on the market right now. And you have the next stage machine and you also have outset medical has a newer machine, a little bit more user friendly or called the Tableau. Peritoneal dialysis, this is the third option. OK, this is a home, another home dialysis modality. You actually don't there's no needles, no blood. You use the lining of your abdomen. That's what, that's what the peritoneum is. To you as a filter to clean your blood. So literally you take a tube, put it into your abdomen, you have that in, surgically inserted, and then you connect that tube to a, a big bag of clean fluid. You put that clean fluid into your abdomen. It soaks there, absorbs the toxins. After a few hours, you drain it out. That's kind of like a manual exchange. It pulls waste and excess fluid out. There's no need for a caregiver at all. <sighs> this is what it looks like. You can do a manual exchange. The lady sitting there, a little bag going in, dirty fluid coming out. But you can also do it by your bedside at night. And this is with a machine. It's called automated peritoneal dialysis. A machine at your bedside, put the bags of fluid on there, connect the machine to your belly, go to sleep for eight, nine hours, and that machine will push fluid in, pull fluid out over the course of the night. Done every night, though. Um, this is what the catheter in the abdomen will actually look like. So this is what's going to be in that cat patient's belly. These are the machines on the market, the Baxter and the Liberty. These are common machines that are in the market as well. Um, and the patient experience at home, you have a patient, the, the, there's no nurse or tech doing the dialysis. The patient and caregiver are doing it, right? So it's either the patient themselves or family member, a mother, father, sister, whoever, that can actually help do the dialysis for the patient. You do have a nurse on call 24 seven. I always tell my patients that are doing home dialysis, you have a nurse on call, you're never alone. You have a dietitian that you're ready to help you with diet, social worker handling insurance and transportation issues. And the doctor visits typically about once a month, once a month. You go, typically go to an office, you meet your whole clinical care team and you go over all your issues and everything, okay? Now, <clears throat> what's great about the, uh, the patient experience here Guess what? Because the dialysis is done more frequently, right? Like it, than the in center experience. The in center experience, in, in center experience is pretty much every other day, three day, three days a week, right? This is more frequently. It's either every day or um, four to five times a week. Uh, because it's more frequent, the patient themselves will have less restrictions on their diet, so they don't have to watch their potassium and phosphorus as much, and they don't have to watch their fluid as much because they're getting more regular dialysis, mimicking a normal kidney. There's more autonomy involved, right? Patients can work and can do other things. And these two last things are why it's more value-based, okay? Because there's oftentimes uh, home dialysis patients are associated with less hospitalizations and better mortality. So you're right now thinking, okay, it sounds pretty cool. <laughs> why aren't we doing more of this? Why haven't we done more of this, right? We, of the 500,000 Americans on dialysis, only about 10 or 15% are on um, uh, home dialysis modalities. And this is one of the biggest pushes for, di for dialysis. And that's why we're having this panel today to discuss the push for home dialysis and is it the right option, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and start off <laughs> with our uh, first guest tonight. Um, this is a gentleman, I went to a conference in Chicago and they were like, uh, one person came up to me is like, hey, if you wanna know about innovation in healthcare, if you wanna know about value-based care, you gotta talk to Jay, you gotta talk to Jay. And I was looking for Jay. <laughs> and I, every time I went to see him, he was surrounded by people. Okay. He was always surrounded. It was like, I couldn't get a hold of him. He was just everyone around him. So please welcome the, the high school quarterback of nephrologists, the chief medical officer of satellite healthcare, Dr. Jay Agarwal. How's it going, Jay? Good. Thank you, Kossum. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the, for the lovely introduction. So, uh, <laughs> Um, as as Kasim said, I, Jay Agarwal, I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Value-Based Care and Population Health at Satellite Healthcare. I uh, was a nephrologist for, still I'm a nephrologist actually, yeah, so I'm a nephrologist, but practice. Recover, a recovering nephrologist? Is that I am a recovering nephrologist. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a growing, it's a growing population, but uh, yeah. 
but yeah, so I've been in, in, I was in practice about 15 years in Southern California and now um, serve as a CMO for, v, uh, for Valley Based Care and Population Health at Satellite. Uh, you know, Satellite, we're a nonprofit uh, kidney care company, about 100 dialysis students across the country, and really a big proponent of home dialysis. I've been a, a big, uh, big proponent of home dialysis in my practice as well. So really excited to have the conversation today and, and really have a have an open conversation with everybody on the panel. So excited. And I, I just love your brand with experience. You you were you did the traditional nephrology route. You did the, everything we did, then you became head of your practice and then you graduated into industry. So I love the fact that you bring that experience to industry. Yeah. The, the, so. the reason why I do it is because there's always needs to be a clinical voice at the table for for our nephrologists and for our patients, right? Okay. Um, and so that's really what I do it for. Next up, okay, next up, we, you know, as nephrologists, you know, it's always those few patients that really make the difference in our lives, right, that you, you kind of live for and then make that experience better. Um, this next guy I'm bringing up, he's one of those kind of patients, like one of those patients that's really involved in their care. Um, and, you, and he's become a patient advocate for the value base, in the value-based space for a lot of people. Um, and he also happens to be really great at taking selfies on dialysis and posting them on social media. <laughs> Mr. Alex, with, from Interwell Health, Mr. Alex Berrios. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Alex. Um, I am 42 years old. I live in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and Kasim, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, um, yes, I do like to take the selfies and you know show people what it's like living uh, with this disease. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I am a one-time kidney transplant recipient. Um, I received a kidney, fortunately, from a living donor back in 2007. Uh, and was able to have and live a, a full 13 years with the kidney. Uh, and then COVID hit. And once COVID hit, uh, the kidney decided to fail again. Not sure if it was related to COVID, but uh, we just know it, it failed. And so uh, I'm back on dialysis. Um, and I am one of those patients where, yes, I am. I've done home dialysis. Uh, I did peritoneal for about one year uh, and found it for me. It just wasn't a great fit. Um, but I, so I am back on in-center hemodialysis and, and enjoying that. And we will discuss further more, more details in my story. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks for having me. Cool. Awesome, man. Okay. Uh, next up, next up, I got this guy. So this guy I met a few years ago, uh, he's smiling already. I can see him already, <laughs> but we had dinner together and I was just taken aback as, 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 as a innate entrepreneur in nature. He's involved in dialysis. He's involved in, uh, kidney disease education. Um, he's a guy like myself. He's a Pakistani kid from New York City that moved to Texas and became a nephrologist just like me. So uh, please welcome to the stage the CEO of Rendiva Dialysis, Dr. Rehan Shah. How you doing, sir? All right. How you doing? Good. Yeah, you, got, you got Brooklyn in the back. You got Brooklyn yeah, in the back. Yeah, there we go. That's the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, <laughs> as you know. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm following your uh, footsteps, Goss. I'm like, you know, from New York and, you know, nephrology and now in Texas. So I live in... Uh, Dallas, Texas, but still reminds me of home back there. So yeah. Have you gotten the the cowboy boots or the pickup yet? No. No, no. But uh, I'm starting to follow the Dallas Cowboys a little bit more than <laughs> sure. I used to. So I don't know. <laughs> All, right. All right. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about yeah, yourself. So okay. uh, my name is Rayhan Shah, and I'm a uh, nephrologist trained at SUNY Downstate in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and then I am uh, the co-founder CEO of Renviva. Uh, Renviva is a physician-owned lead dialysis company uh, focused on improving outcomes, empowering nephrologists and patients, uh, and uh, focusing on, on home therapies. And uh, that's why this is extremely relevant for us, and I'm excited to be here and uh, the conversation that we're going to have today. Cool, cool. All right, let's get into it then. Let's get it. It's round three. It's round three. So first question, this is going to go to the doctors first and then Alex, Okay. Mm -hmm. If you had to choose your form of dialysis to do on yourself, in-center hemodialysis, home hemodialysis, or peritoneal dialysis, which one would you choose and why? Who wants to, which doctor wants to take that one first? Sure, I can take it, sure. Go for it, Jay, go for it. I would do uh, home hemodialysis, uh, most definitely. Um, you know, allowing myself to be at home uh, would be quite important and not having to come into dialysis unit and. And the frequency in which they're needing to do it as well, right? So not needing necessarily to do it every day like peritoneal dialysis allowed me a lot of ability to be free and to be able to go and, and live my life as much as possible. And that's why I tell patients, you know, we really, it's it's difficult to be on dialysis in itself, but as much as we can try to live a, as close of a resemblance to normal life as possible with being on dialysis, I mean, that's really important. So I would definitely choose home hemodialysis. 
Cool. All right, Rayhan, you then me. I'll go after. Go for it. So I'll choose um, nocturnal home hemodialysis. Um, okay. We have a uh, Dr. Virginia Scott actually backed you up right there on there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so I'll choose that. I mean, just because um, I know during the day I'm always on the move, and uh, so are we. So is everyone else. You know, and, and valuing that for ourselves and for our patients and the community. So knowing that I could do it at night while I sleep, uh, I, you know, I'm always multitasking. So I feel like I could do two, two things at once. Um, but I would, yeah, I would choose uh, home hemodialysis. And for all the clinical reasons uh, that Jay had mentioned as well, um, but I think what we'll learn today and what we'll bring out is what's always ideal is not always practical. And, and you know, what we'll kind of bring out today is why there's only like a 0.3% prevalence of home hemo versus everything else. And uh, love for us to get into more detail for why yeah. hemo is not where it needs to be. So I'm going to go, and this is going to be one of my biases, I'm going towards PD. And the reason why I'm going towards PD is because um, I've, I'm an interventional nephrologist. I've worked on these dialysis accesses. I've seen the problems that develop occasionally. So I would probably want to have that last in my arm and want to go with peritoneal first. And that could be just by biases is what I've seen as an interventionalist. Not that they've been horrible or something, but just, you know, all the inter some of the interventions you have to have and all that kind of stuff. I liked peritoneal dialysis. I, I always feel like you've got to wear this out first and then go to the real estate in the arms. That's always been my kind of philosophy in a weird way. Um, but yeah, so that's where I'm going. So we got two, uh, we got an eight home HD, we got a nocturnal and I got a, we got a PD. Alex, sure. you're going to call BS on us right now? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you, as a patient who's, who's been through, I've done in-center, I've done PD, um, back on in-center, you know, yeah. as a patient who first didn't have a choice back of modality at all. Back in 2006, when I did this, I had to do in-center. Nobody, my nephrologist at the time and, you know, in 2006, didn't tell me about PD or home emo. There was no push for it. Fast forward now, 13 years later, as a, you know, after the kidney transplant failed and during COVID, you know, I'm back on dialysis. And so when I, with all the uh, opportunities and, and what I learned, I, you know, I picked PD because I thought PD was going to be, you know, a, a little easier on, you know, all the things I read about it being easier on the belly, being able less, you know, restrictive on the food, all the things we were talking about earlier. Um, so yeah, I would have picked, you know, I, I picked PD and, you know, I found for me, uh, it didn't necessarily, and we talked to kind of led into that a little bit, you know, there are some, there are some, there are some barriers there that I don't think I really realized. Um, and so I am back on in center and actually enjoying that a little better. It's a lot. It's I'm so sorry. Easier. What was the reason you left PD? You just didn't, the experience was bad. Or like the, the experience for me, PD, the experience, the training could have been a little bit better by the nurses at the clinic I was at. I felt like I was rushed into the, into the PD. Uh, and I also, um, you know, my lifestyle and what I had, I had two, I have two young children. And so, you know, there was just a, an issue of like, you know, when you're on a cycler, I was on the Liberty for eight, nine hours, nine, ten, my first, my subscription, my prescription was nine and a half, almost 10 hours. Wow. So, so, you know, I had to be asleep in, in my bed or in a chair at seven 30 to then make sure I was up in the next, to, the next day to get my kid to school in the morning because you know, you had to be on and you couldn't really move. So it, it there was some restrictions. I felt kind of isolated. Did you ever think about manual exchanges by any chance? Do you ever talk about I, I did. And so I did, I did the manuals in the beginning and, and that was okay. But then, it, you know, I work full time. So there was that element of having to kind of stop what I was doing every three to four hours to have to do that, to do those exchanges. So it became a little bit of a burden to from for myself. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I love, I love like you, you actually, I, it made me think differently about PD. That mm -hmm. is totally the way you do it. Sure. So, sure. All right. So what in your minds, guys, what makes you a good candidate for home dialysis? Not just PD or HD, but what in general makes you a good candidate for home dialysis? And that has to do with your health, but also maybe personality traits. What do you, what have you guys seen in your careers? I can go as a patient. I'll, I'll say that I've seen and I've talked to people in my career, um, having a trusted caregiver and a loved one who's going to be really educated and help kind of champion for you as a, sounds good. I've met, talked to patients who, and as a patient myself, you know, to when you're, you're kind of quiet and you don't want to necessarily take it all in and learn the education of PD or home hemo to make sure that I think having somebody who can help champion for you while you're doing it and making sure that they understand, you know, the ramifications and the understanding of 
of this disease and, and what you have to do and all the different steps you have to take and, and the cleanliness and the, uh, of the area and making sure people are organized. That's like a big trade as well. Organization is key. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Jay, you want to go or is Rayhan, sure. you want to talk about your experience with patients and what you sure. think I'm a good I'm candidate? Sure. I go first is fine. Um, you know, I think, yeah, I agree with everything Alex says, mm -hmm. you know, having a, having someone at home and having a cleanly environment, but I mean, it's also just having an, an engaged, an engaged patient. Yeah. You know, and then that's really had that time, that CKD care to, to be engaged about what's going on with their, their health and wants to take that active role. Right. And that's a scary part when someone's starting dialysis to be able to have to take that active role. And mm -hmm. so I think that really comes from, you know, the right patients when that's been engaged along the, along the paths that when they make that transition, it, it's yeah. one that's successful, right? And because when it's, when it happens, and it's not successful. It, it, it's not well, it's not well for the patient. It's not well for the dialysis. It's not well for the nurses. So, so I think really getting that engaged patient in the CKD space is really probably in, in my mind, really the one that, when the keys to success of being on. So on I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna push back against it, Jay. But I, you know, I went to this next stage presentation. This was years ago, probably five or six years ago. They actually brought this dude from Houston, and he was this non-compliant in-center hemodialysis patient, right? Completely non-compliant. And they somehow trained him to be to do home hemo, and he completely changed his demeanor, okay. changed his lifestyle. All of a sudden, that ability, I guess, of self-care and being able to take care of himself changed mm -hmm. completely. No, I, I, I agree. I agree, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, there's an echo. But um, I agree with you that necessarily that they're, um, you know, the best patient is one that's engaged, but also non-compliance by itself shouldn't be necessarily a contraindication because sometimes people are non-compliant. I've had patients that are non-compliant with their in-center because they feel horrible when they do yeah. in-center, right? And so just because someone isn't showing up to dialysis doesn't mean that they, they can't do home dialysis is really understanding why they're not there. And, and, and for many patients are in center, it, it makes them feel horrible afterwards when they go home. So yeah, absolutely. So non-compliance is not necessarily a contraindication in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Rayhan, go for it, man. Go for it. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say in terms of dialysis, it's not one size fits all, right? It's really having the patient um, and, and all the stakeholders involved together. It's the nephrologist, it's the patient, it's the social worker, dietitian, everyone coming together and seeing what is the, um, the best modality and what are some of the pros and cons and what are some of the, the, the risk and benefits for each you know, uh, modality. And, and, and I think that's a conversation that probably needs to happen more and it has to happen earlier as to Jay's point, I mean, a lot of times, you know, even as nephrologists, we get our first time I'm seeing a patient would be stage four, uh, progressing to dialysis. And all of a sudden that first conversation, you know, within a few months is about dialysis where you have not built up any, you know, relationship with the patient and you're going to lose credibility if the first thing you're talking about is dialysis. So it's intervening, interve intervening earlier, but also having a team-based approach where it's, patient centric um and uh and you lead it you lead that education that way no i i agree and the, the inherent problem is like I, there's been so many times i've had the conversation of dialysis on the first or second uh talk oh yeah and yeah. it's like it's a horrible hello right it's like it's like it just it just destroys everything so but um okay look, we talked about what makes you a good candidate but what's a barrier to doing home dialysis for patients and, and the home scenario. Like, so go ahead. So I, I would speak to this and barriers I faced um, is really the logistics and the cadence of the equipment. Um, with At least with PD, I'll speak to the PD equipment. You get these massive boxes weighing 30 to 40, 50 pounds, um, at 30 or 40 of them coming to you once a month that are last you once a month and you go through and you're utilizing the the, the fluid that you're, you talked about, the seam about, you know, going into your stomach. And um, I had an experience where it was bad snowstorm and my delivery driver um, couldn't get in. So he just dropped it on a pallet in front of my house. But when they're really supposed to bring it into your home, put it into a room um, and lay it where you want, where you ask them, you don't have to touch it as a patient. Uh, only when you need to, you know, obviously take the stuff out for the treatment. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, various of this, and I live in a three bedroom, 1500 square foot apartment and with two kids, a do two dogs and a fiance. So, you know, space wise for me and my experience, again, living with, with the barriers are, are that that's a big piece of it is the fact that like, there's just a lot of equipment and there's a lot of things that take over your space. Um, 
I think, you know, some other, like, I think some mental barriers, something like that as well, or the issues of, again, like being isolated because you're in a room that's closed off that you have to, you know, make sure there's nobody can be in there, especially I had two dogs, right? So there can be no yeah. fur, no high chance of infection. We talk about that. And so I think that's something to consider and to know that like, you don't have that chance to be socialized while you're doing this. I mean, once you're connected, you know, yeah, a family member can come by, like my son or can come in and, and read a story with me while I'm connected. And we've done that a couple, we had done that a couple of times, a few times, but for the most part, I was so nervous to want to have any, bring anybody in because again, that's so with PD, I've, you know, there's such a high chance of infection, keeping things clean and, and all that stuff. You want to make sure that that happens. Uh, and one of the, one of my earlier homes I lived in when I first came back to dialysis, um, I had was in a, in a room that had really old rugs and had a lot of like dog stuff. So to get prepared for it, I, uh, requested to take the rugs out and get new hardwood floor just because I wanted to make sure that things were really, you know, clean and, 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 and um, and there that we can alleviate those germs and i was using filters and things of that nature um so that those are some of the physical barriers that i i face having to kind of readjust my home you know the, the equipment and then obviously the isolation that you face when you're sitting there and not being able to use um, what's the experience as a home dialysis patient versus in center do you like the socialization of in center better for me i do again in my experience i like the fact that like i can talk to other patients and Share, hear their stories and be able to kind of pick pick my brain about you know diet and food what they're eating what the, how their phosphorus is what their you know what their kt over v might look like what you know has been looking like having that conversation makes it feel a bit more more normal and one big thing for me is with in center and hemo on the tuesday thursday saturday when i'm not on dialysis i can be somewhat normal and not have to think about it whereas you almost with, get a mini with, holiday. With, yeah, 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 exactly. So, but with like with with home hemo, with home, at least with PD with me, it was always in your face, always there, always a reminder that you have this disease. And right. there's something to be said about that, I think. All right, Jay, you brought up home hemo. Um, mm -hmm. What do, what do you think of the barrier of self cannulation, like the idea of sticking a needle into yourself? Do you think that's a big hurdle for a lot of people? Oh yeah, I think that's a that's a big barrier, you know, for individuals. And I, again, I, I said that I would do it. But that's also me coming as a as a nef nephrologist and as a physician, right? So I can definitely see that PD is definitely for, you know, for individuals starting, you know, a little bit less uh, anxiety provoking, being bloodless and needleless, right? Um, I I think that that's a you know that that is a huge barrier for people coming. I'm also just the equipment and you know you know they're hooking up plumbing. There's other there's a lot of issues needing to have in the right household to be able to do that as well with HHD. Um, but I did like Alex's point about about um, about the socialization within the within the in center, you know, units, and and I think that is one of the barriers is actually a lot of patients that we're getting to we're educating them about home dialysis in the in center dialysis unit, and, and that's a struggle um, to get people home because they they're comfortable with their in center unit they've already been in um, when we get them, and so I think part of that our system the way it's set up with that delayed care and people starting dialysis straight from hospital to you know, to the Dallas you know, is, a, is a big barrier for us really being able to get get people home because that making that change is hard. Yeah. So, um, Rehan, like, have you had experience with like these transitional care units and all these kind of things as well too? Like that transition between in center home or Dallas, you know, that whole hospital and home kind of thing, or no? Yeah. No. Definitely. In, in fact, even uh, from the uh, nursing home sniff uh, standpoint as well, um, you know how that whole transition happens. So, yeah. No. I mean, the social aspect I've I've heard a few times, um, and uh, and I. I, I I, I understand, and I think that's why, like having a social environment, even through like technology, social platforms, is even more important. Like, and that can alleviate some of the um, the factors or some of the, the the lack of you know social environments for the home or patients who are doing home is uh, have a stronger support group. And I know there's there's things out there, but I do think with technology. Uh, more interaction and and keeping it more engaging uh, are is is extremely important. But the physical barriers, Alex, that you mentioned, the cannulation, I think for home hemo is is you know that mental block of being able to do it and and having that support, I think, is key. And and how do we bring more care to the home, right? And it's not, it's not just you know having the patient have a support, but it's ancillary services. I feel that. Um, or ancillary support systems that can be in the home, that's where all the care is going anyway, but why not bring that level of care uh, home as well?
So you know what's interesting? So like I remember like uh, uh, you guys ever heard of like an in-center holiday? You ever heard of that concept? So someone's doing like home HD um, for a while. The spouse and the, the and the, the patient get burned out from the home dialysis. They bring them in-center for like a month to give that spouse like a spouse a holiday. And I've done that in San Antonio. Are you, are you guys doing that? And guys, if you don't know what that is, essentially is you're doing home dialysis. You're putting a lot of burden on the spouse and the household. You do an in-center to that patient go to center for like two weeks or a month just to kind of give a break to the family and give that, that alleviation. And then you go back to the home sales. Have you guys heard of that concept before? And is that a solution like Rehan was talking about? Like that, is that the solution? Give more holiday, like an in-center holiday to home dialysis patients just to get that socialization and other things or what? Um, yeah, I mean, you can't even call it like, like respite care, right? So it's interesting yeah. to call it like respite care for, you know, for, for the caregivers and, you know, can that help? Yeah, in certain instances. But, you know, it, it oftentimes, if it needs to be done quite often, then maybe it's maybe it's not the solution, right? Maybe it's not the right modality for the individual, but at, from time to time when it's needed, uh, definitely it's one of the solutions. And then trying to, you know, you know, where do you do that respite care? Do you do it in a home unit? Do you do it in a you know, an in-center unit, those, those are some of the thoughts is sort of, you know, keeping the patient within their own unit as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, and, he, uh, and have you, because uh, I you know what's weird is I actually have seen the strain on the family. Like I've seen, I'm not going to say a divorce, but I've seen spouses, like you could tell the relationship changes, you know, when they're having to be the primary caregiver of somebody, right? Uh, or have, I've had one, one issue, this was years ago, but cannulation was difficult on a patient. And the wife couldn't get it and it was so difficult on and you can tell the relationship between them was kind of hurt too because of that so um but yeah um let's see here so uh any other drawbacks you guys see rayon you see any other drawbacks that you've seen um that or or at barriers how's about that barriers I mean, if we talk overall like i mean it, it, we just focus more on the logistical and the equipment and all that i mean i, mean, I would say uh nursing staffing is is the biggest is uh when it comes to home, if we're talking about overall barriers, um, I, I think you were maybe the question was more from the patient perspective. I think that's what you're focused on. But, but if, you're, if, you, if you got the dial, tell, tell us the dialysis perspective. That'd be great. Man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, the yeah. challenge right now is is uh, home dialysis nurses, right? Like, um, and so so that's the challenge is like how many dialysis nurses are trained in PD and HHD. And if you're setting up a home program to try to find that is is extremely, you know, challenging and you have to wait, like, for example, Texas, six, it takes six months to um, a, a amount of experience to be, you know, able to to be a home dialysis nurse. Um, you know, now it's three months and the rest of the country is three. But even that, what if you're in areas that they don't have the ability to get the experience that they need? So I think staffing shortages uh, from home are, are probably the biggest barrier that we're experiencing and I think everyone's experiencing. I would definitely, uh, Rehan, um, echo what you're saying. As, as somebody who went through the training for PD in my home clinic, uh, the home training, it was definitely felt rushed and it took them a while for them to get me a nurse to, to train me. And then when they did train, it wasn't the best training, I so think. Yeah. Bianca Blanco just uh, on uh, the main interesting point, nurses are making a lot of money at three times a week. Many do not want to move to a five day week schedule. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. that could be a part of it. Interesting. Um, let's see. Oh, and then Dr. Bija Patel said dialysis providers need to implement cross training. So I guess you can train them for both, right? Yeah. Um, let's see here. So now, do you think the push by Medicare and value based care for more home is a good thing? And why? And do you think we're going too far? Like, you know, if you look at the CMS, so the, the, the Trump executive order on kidney health that came out in 2019, the one of the goals was 2025 have 80 percent of by 2025 have 80% of new ES, ESRD starts start dialysis at home or get a or get a preemptive transplant, right? That was the that's the goal. Do you think that goes too far? Do you think we can get 80% or 60, 70% of our patients to home, the new new diagnosis, or go for it, anybody? Um, I'll start. I, I think it's, you know, I think if we do what we do today and we treat and educate people for home dialysis and advanced CKD and have our same care model for for providing home dialysis and incident dialysis today, I think getting those numbers will be difficult. I think in order for us to get those numbers, we need to think innovatively in terms of how do we educate patients? Um, how do we bring patients from not starting from the hospital and crashing in the hospital? How do we get more CKD care to patients? How do we think about different ways of training? I mean, Alex just mentioned the training. 
right? And so how do we how do we train in new innovative ways and efficient ways? And as as Rehan mentioned, how do we bring more of that care to the home? Um, you know, in, in general. And so if we don't innovate in those realms, um, I think it may be difficult to get there. So I think this is where the the innovation is being spurred by some of these new payment models that are incentivizing individuals or, or nephrologists and, and organizations to promote home dialysis. But I think it's a step in the right direction, but is it enough to get us there? Is it enough of an incentive? Um, you know, I think that's you know, that's questionable. Yeah. Rehan, you got, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, so I'm less worried about the, the number of the executive order and what numbers we're trying to get to. I think that um, I, we should, we're just focused on the immediacy, right? Like, what do we need to do now? Like all the points Jay's mentioned, and that's exactly it. So um, we just need to keep pushing to, to do better. Um, but I, I think the it, it's really addressing all facets, right? Like it's, and, and what we do, like at, even at, at Renviva is, is it's a three prong approach. It's focusing on patient education, focusing on physician empowerment. I mean, if you look at it, um, I mean, coming out of fellowship, it, you know, they did a survey of like 600 nephrologists in 2010. Um, and they said that 48 percent of nephrologists were not totally comfortable with peritoneal dialysis. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. And then, you know, I mean, so it's uh, so it's not just patient education, that's that's one piece of it. But I think physician um, and provider education support um, is, is a key factor. So focusing on that, uh, embracing our relationships, our colleagues, uh, and being a, a, a network of uh, providers that you know, can bring that support to other f physicians and bounce ideas off of, of how we can do it. And the third actually is going back to um, the the dialysis nurses, like the, the empowering and giving an opportunity to the director of nurses that truly run a home program uh, by giving them leadership opportunities, giving them ownership opportunities. Like that's, those are the things that we can do of, of, a, of a multi prong approach. Uh, to that paradigm shift that we need. So to your point, man, honestly, with training programs, I feel like I got an excellent training education, a fellowship, but I wasn't trained that well in PD, right? Like, so I can give, if I can give dialysis orders at two in the morning with a patient crashing in the ER with my eyes closed, half asleep, and just like that, and my wife can do it too because she's heard me do it a million times, right? <laughs> but PD, I have to think about. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I have to think. I mean, and Alex, I know you're nodding your head, but it's not that it's not that it's not as intuitive to me because of the training we received. Because it wasn't home dialysis was not as emphasized. And again, I trained in 2008, 2010. In in custom, it's it's even if you take HHD, I think it's even it's even more folks have been more uncomfortable. That's why we we do like a home dialysis academy of excellence. My my colleague Graham Abra, um, you know, Dr. Abra, he he runs that where we bring fellows in to try to teach them. You know more about and hands-on with the machines, hands-on with the, with how to how to prescribe uh, and try to do some of those education. Because I agree, it's one of the it's one of the limitations for sure. And Alex, I'm gonna go to you. Like, so you you hang out with the patients, right? You're there. We get mm -hmm. one side of them. Everyone acts different when the principal walks in the office, right? Right. <laughs> sure. like, yeah. Exactly. When you're there in the background mm -hmm. and you're talking to regular Joe Schmo, Joe Joe Schmo or Maria yeah. Garcia, right. dialysis patient, right? You're talking to them. Mm -hmm. Are these people wanting to do home dialysis or are they afraid? In my, it, yeah, in my, they're, they're like, hey, I'm coming here. It's cool. I get a free ride here. It's, it's fine. You know? Sure. Okay. In my experience in both, um, and I've done a lot of different work from when I was transplanted. I talk to patients and actively now and the work I do, I, I really think, you know, it's all about stages of readiness for the patient that you're speaking with. Right. So like you want to kind of give them the education. And, and again, we've been talking about the big word we've been hearing is empowerment, right, for the nephrologist. But big empowerment for the patients and understanding, helping the patients have that choice to let them know there's all these modalities of dialysis in front of them. If they're going to have to do dialysis, then give them the best choice that's going to fit their scenario, their life, their lifestyle. Um, and I think, you know, it comes down to the fact that I think some are afraid. Yeah, some are afraid um, because I think they want to, they don't trust themselves enough to be able to feel they can cannulate, right? Or they don't feel that they can, um, you know, get the, get all the fluid out or, you know, if they're doing PD, if they feel too full, you know, like all those things that kind of come with, with, with the, um, with those home modalities. Um, so I, I have seen that, that patients have been afraid. Um, and, you know, I think again, the, the crux of what we're trying to talk about today is really, 
you know, looking at value-based care is really empowering the patient to give them the best choice to succeed with this, with this, you know, at the end of the day, right. You want to make sure they have the best choice. They have all the information in front of them to make the best choice for themselves. Can I ask you a real, in the, like, when you're out there in Dallas community, do, do they understand that like home dialysis typically leads to better outcomes or are, do they always, they don't, horror yeah, stories? they don't, you, they hear their horror stories. So again, you're, ha- you're there to bur- to bust those <laughs> myths too. Right. So they don't want to, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm afraid I'm going to bleed out. What's going to happen if I do bleed out? I don't have a nurse in front of me right there in that second. So they don't necessarily know. And again, I consider myself a rare bird in this field just because I'm engaged and I do a lot of research and look at the data and look at the outpatient outcomes just because I'm a nerd and I like to look at that kind of stuff <laughs> uh, with this disease, right? So yeah. I'm just that kind of person. But I think the typical Joe, you know, John, Jane, Jane Doe, uh, who's on dialysis, at least in my, in the region where I've been, a lot of them are just kind of like, this is my lot in life. I'm going to do this. Um, and they don't want to be a, 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 as active in their care. Um, and that's, that was frustrating to see. Um, but that's the reality that I've, I've noticed. And I mean, I've talked to you before, Alex, I remember when we first talked, man, I was just like taken aback at how involved you are in your care. And you're like that ideal patient. A lot of us want. Sure. Uh, sure, And and, and, and I would say the apathy can be both sides. You see non-engaged nephrologists too. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like, so when you're doing these rounds, so like, you know, it's hard to come across a patient like yourself. So I always take, even though I, I respect everything you say, I really do. I always say, this is Alex, though, <laughs> you know, like, you know, um, like, you know I, I mean, I, I'm just going to say, Carlson, what's the, what's the normal education, Alex, you could tell us, like, what's yeah. the, when you go to a nephrologist's office, <laughs> like, you go to a busy private practice, um, what, what is that education like? You, the education typically when it comes to home dialysis is uh, Gossam sounding like the micro machine guy telling about in 10 minutes, uh, <laughs> giving the whole yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. dialysis. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you summed it up in 10 minutes, which is great, but that's that's how we're presenting the patients too. Uh, I mean, yeah. that, that's kind of yeah. how it is. And so, I mean, you know, how, how do you expect patients to say, yes, I'm going to choose home dialysis after what we just presented in you know five minutes of exactly your right no but no. Re- Rehan, that that's been longer than than many offices <laughs> now to really to yeah. do to exactly. do this you have to pull up a chair you have to sit down you have to talk to the patient and it does mm-hmm. our health system the way it's set up right now with the way clinic visits are and you know and how quick the yeah. clinic visits are does, is that even really ample enough time to really have that conversation yeah. and you know and to, to, to costumes really your point is there every nephrologist you know, well-versed enough to, to have that conversation. I think that's why we see variability, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think, I think it goes both ways that you, you have to have engaged nurses, empower doctors, nurses, and um, what can we call it? And patients as well. Um, Jay, you brought up di- Medicare incentivizing it. How are they incentivizing it? And do you think it's enough? And Rayhan, you, you take on that too. So. So, I mean, I, I think the two ways of incentivizing them I and mean, some of the new payment models are, you know, KCC, there is an incentive, uh, you know, on a per patient basis for patients that are at home. Uh, but I think overall, it's is as as there's movement to from fee for service, you know, from volume based payments for providers to outcomes based payments and even to total cost of care payments, is that, is that if you're able to have and manage patients at home, have them dialyze more frequently, you know, keep them out of the hospital more often. You know, are organizations taking risk for that, and and those that are, are they able to drive value for that themselves? So in that way, they're sort of incentivizing provider groups, whether that be you know dialysis provider groups or nephrology provider groups, for being able to get more patients to, to at home and spending and investing that time and that effort and that money to do that, so that we can we can actually have a different system of educating patients and following them through that journey to get them there. Yeah. Now, so, do you think like the value-based models, and I'm going to let you in, Rayhan, too, but do you think the value-based models, I know when you go at risk, and at risk, guys, if you don't know what that means, is essentially the practice goes at risk for the patient. So if they if there's a cost, if there's a lot of cost associated with hospitalizations and bad outcomes, that you get kind of a ding or you don't get paid enough. So that's actually changes the alignment, the incentive structure there. But do you think that the value-based medicine part is more focused on that, or is it more focused on the home dialysis? And, and are the incentives enough to get there? Yes. So I, mean, I think it, it, it's the it is focused on educating the patient to get them on the right modality, right? And yeah. so if you do that, you will reduce your your cost of your care for your patient, right? Okay. And they'll have better they'll have better clinical outcomes. And if you do that well, you know, I do think you can get you know PD rates or home home dialysis rates and 
high 25s, 30s, and plus percentages. So I think that will. So that's, that's your rate. You think 25, 30 percent? You think? I think that I think that can easy, that that can be done with a well well designed program. You ask me, 50 percent the way it is right now. Okay. Um, you know, I think that that's a bit of a stretch, but I mean, I know what Rayhan and others think, but I think, I'm going to uh, take it to Rayhan now, guys. We're about closing out. I want to get some questions out there. So if anybody, you guys are putting a ton of comments out there, I'm going to go scroll them, but I want to know if you guys have any questions for the panel. Um, and please put them in the comment section right now. So as many questions as you can, Rayhan, go ahead. You're, you're, yeah. I, I mean, I'll keep it short, but I, financial, uh, I mean, I think the whole value base, uh, is like, I, I get it. I get conceptually, uh, and, well, theoretically, as well as objectively, the, the the whole thing, but it's still a financial incentive, right? So we're uh, we're motivating based on financial incentive to the nephrologist. My question would be, and if we want to really look at it, wouldn't it be better to clinically incentivize patients to do home versus incentivizing patients? Like, what if we looked at it that way and said? Well, if I was a value-based and CMS and, and everything else, well, how do we incentivize the patient to take better care of themselves and do what may be a better modality for them versus focusing on maybe the financial incentive for the nephrologist as well? So so I, I, I think you need it both ways. It shouldn't be just one or the other. I don't think it's you know black and white, but, um, but I'm just thinking and putting it out there that perhaps you know, we should start looking at you know the patient um, and what incentivizes them to, to to take better care of themselves. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. And what's your what's your guess for where where we can go? Let's just let's just leave technology as it is with the current machines, the Baxter machines, and the um, the and the you know Tableau and Next Stage and all those machines. At the current with the current technology, where do you think the home dialysis rate should be? Like, is it? 10, uh, I think Jay, you said twenty five percent, probably right. Twenty five thirty. I mean, across. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay, go for it. Ray, where, where do you think it'd be around? I, I don't have a number. Um, I don't have a number. Okay. I'm not even focused on that because I'm more focused on mm -hmm. like really just, just just doing going day to day and just doing what we need because I, I don't, I, I think Jay knows the data uh, and Jay's more uh, in depth with the data perhaps, but um, yeah, I, I can't put numbers out there because I can't forecast that. No, and, 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 and I would, I would, I'd agree. Yeah. yeah, the numbers, the number is, is whether the percentage at home or not, you know, is, is important, but ideally is getting pe people on the right modality, right? right? And if the right modality, I mean, that, that you asked about, how you mentioned about incentivizing patients if they go home to give them an incentive, but home may not be the right thing for every patient, right? right? So how do we incentivize someone to go home, but if that's not the right modality for them? So the idea is, is how do you, how do you get them to the right modality? And whatever that is, if that's in-center, they should do in-center. If that's the right modality for them, they shouldn't just do home just yeah. because it's home dialysis. It's not the yeah. right for, it's not the right modality for everybody. Interesting. We got, uh, we got an interesting one here. Dr. Bijou Patel, I just said 60% with the right support. So he's putting a number on it. guys. So he's putting it on it. No, 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 no pressure, Bijou. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you always right. aim, aim high. All right. <laughs> Let's go for, I'm going to go for questions, guys. Please don't ask the questions. I'm going to actually get some questions here. Alex, one for you. Hey, sure. it's a pretty cool one. Um, okay. At what point, Alex, at, how early on did you learn about your options? How long ago? I didn't. So my options. So I knew when I had gotten my transplant that at some point I'm 42. I knew at the time in my 20s that there was a chance it was going to fail again. That I would. I knew that I was going to have to go on a modality uh, and to go back on dialysis. So probably while I was probably maybe year two or three into my transplant, was I saying, okay, I'm going to look at my options and see what's in front of me. And that's when I started to do my own research looking at different organizations that were patient centric, like uh, National Kidney Foundation, American, American Association of Kidney Patients and looking at all their education and resources. Um, and so it's looking at and reading it up and seeing what it was all about. And so then I, when I would have my annual transplant appointments, I would talk to my nephrologist, both transplant and my community transplant, um, uh, community nephrologist and just say, hey, when we get to this point, I'd like to just have this discussion with you. So I made a point to kind of talk to my team a little bit when I knew things were happening. And again, it lasted 13 years. So in year 12, when things started, numbers started kind of creeping kind of crazily and knew that I needed to kind of look, maybe consider it. That's when I had that more conversation about that, the options of that, so. Interesting. Okay, so we yeah. got a nurse practitioner coming up, Marie, um, Marie Renzi. She goes, as an NP, I cannot understand why I spend an hour teaching all modalities, advocating mainly for PD, and then and, uh, at the end of the talk, patient agrees to PD. Then the next visit with a physician, they change their mind and go to in-center hemodialysis. So do you think more 
consistency and how we talk. And I mean, I think that's an interesting point because I've had that happen too, where I've been all PD or been in modality and all of a sudden they go, um, they all go, uh, patient goes in better. Um, have you guys had that? I mean, go ahead. But, um, yeah, I mean, it does happen sometimes. I mean, usually I've seen it when it happens in going to other providers. I think there's educating even like I've had cardiologists or or primary care doctors that don't understand the difference between you know, the modalities and they talk to their primary care doctor or, or another specialist that may convince them otherwise. I've, I've had that happen to me in my practice. But also, no matter who we talk to, even if as a nephrologist talk to them or MP, anyone talks to them, patients do sometimes you know change their mind. That's why it's a multi it's a multi touch point and it's not just, you know, one, one talking to the patient, we're done and they understand it. it's just, it takes multiple times of talking to them, in my opinion. So. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's hear a question for anyone on the panel. I'll give, give it to you, Rehan. If you could wave your hand, wand and see one big change in the Dallas experience, including home, what would it be? Well, Oh man, that's, that's a, good thing it went to you, Rehan. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 that one. You, yeah. One, um, yeah, that's. Uh, I, I guess uh, if I, I guess if I were to say it, it would really be just getting all, get, getting everyone like uh, together as all, like pretty much all stakeholders of health into one kind of platform in the sense of patients, nursing providers um value based companies like putting them all together and making it more patient centric uh, versus you know working it the other way around and from the top down so I, I would I would say the only way to really change and to to drive this change would be to to be more patient centric um and having giving everyone a voice uh, and, and I could I could tell you from that's from personal experience uh I mean we um like when we created our education platform, Creative Health Media, my partners uh, and I, and we had, um, you know, and patients who are part of our team and, and contributors. Like, I mean, I learned so much from that experience was that like, you know, for example, I focus on kidney recipients, um, but it was the patients that were like, well, you know, I've been waiting around for this transplant for, for years now, focus on the donors. Why do you focus on the recipients? And, um, and, and made us go back to the drawing board and just totally switch the way we deliver and what we talked about. So, yeah, so I, I do think if a magic wand would be to, to make it patient centric. Interesting. I got a guy here. I think he may know you because I think he's like a super fan, Alex. Um, <laughs> his name is Michael Milliton, a middle, middleman. Yes. Uh, for Alex, what's a reality that you think none of the docs on the panel understand? Um, you know, I, yeah, good question, Mike. Thank you for asking <laughs> that, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, so, you know, I think the reality, I think sometimes it goes back to the beginning of understanding and giving the patient the time and, and energy and hearing their story. I know you all have, I know some nephrologists, you know, you guys want to take care of us and I get it. But I think that sometimes you mentioned earlier, I think Jay and Rehan about how you only get like 10 minutes or five minutes to describe something because you're on your next patient. If, if there's if there was a way to understand that like sometimes we just don't always get it and so it's to understand and to really give us the opportunity to explain it to us like in the movie philadelphia if you've seen it denzel walking is like, explain it to me explain to this to me like i'm a six-year-old you know like really uh, give it to the to the patient in a way that they're gonna want to understand it and and when you disseminate the information to them that they understand this disease and that, you know, and to be on that journey with them. I know you got, we, you are, and that's collectively what you all do, but I think really, I think it needs to be, there needs to be a more, an opportunity to really sit and, and get to know that patient's story and, mm -hmm. and know, cause you know, when we, when we, when I crashed into dialysis back in my twenties, I didn't have, I know I didn't have that, that help that I am seeing and I've been able to get now. So like, no, I, I'm all about the patient story and understand the patient story, but I feel like many patients don't want to open up. You that happens. Too? Yeah, no, no, that happens too. And, I, and that's yeah. where it goes back to the whole patient, you know, stages of readiness and understanding where they are and knowing yeah. to say, okay, you might not be ready right now, but to really be as best you can to follow up. Again, I know, you know, this method, it's, it's a, it's kind of like that magic wand thing. And if we could get it to, so that we, you guys had the time to do it, that'd be great. But I understand you all have a lot you between clinics, 
running a, running your own you know, office and then having all the hospitals, I get that it's you guys are super swamped and have a lot going on. But in a, in a perfect world, as a patient, I would love for a, a doctor to really sit and listen, you know, and then just also follow and be better at following up. Who's the person in the dialysis unit you guys connect the most with? Is it the social worker, di dietitian? Is it the um, is it the nurse or the tech? Like, I feel like there's certain relationships that build in those dialysis units. So who, for, who's the one that you guys get to connect with? For me, it was always the tech, um, just because they were the ones kind of setting up my machine, taking all my weights, and it's when it would were very personable. Um, uh, but like with the social worker and the, and the nurse, they're so busy having to run to every chair and, and make sure everything, whereas the tech is like usually dedicated to your station and things of that nature. So I enjoyed working with the tech and, and giving, you know, having that opportunity to talk with them. I thought you were going to say the nephrologist. I know. I'm sorry. You, you see the, I only see no. the nephrologist once, twice a month. You know, no, and sometimes it's, and then it's, you know, it's the nurse or the nurse practitioner, right? So, well, and, yeah. and it's probably even harder now because like all the turnover um, oh, and all the, you know, so you develop a relationship with a tech and that Maybe. tech may not be there anymore. Yeah, so. uh, the nurses, my first, uh, I mean, I can give you an anecdotal situation. So I was at a clinic about a month ago that I was going to for a while and that clinic only ran nurses that were travel. So it was 12 weeks, 11 weeks and they're gone to yeah. another clinic so you never so i felt like i had to always kind of share my story every six to eight to ten to weeks and it was always changing i agree but by the way costume you didn't ask me the question but my magic want to be and i think what we're hearing will be redefining right. redefining ckd care because our whole purpose should be for patients not to hopefully not get on dialysis exactly. or to get a transplant right they should get okay. a transplant I, i'm sorry i didn't need that do. question you need to redefine that yeah, really. Good and, and, you, and to your point, so I should have deferred to you, but I actually was going to bring this up. Just like you said, someone brought up one LinkedIn user doesn't say who it is, said artificial kidney at, uh, um, uh, explanation point. I'm like, that's not the solution here. Like everyone wants the artificial no. kidney. I don't want to put artificial kidneys into people. We want to slow down see kidney disease progression, right? Together, we, right. We prevent people from ever going on it, that. But that's not just nephrologists, right? That's primary no. care doctors. That's diabetes management. That's hypertension mm. management. That's exactly. a lot of things. So it's not just mm -hmm. the nephrology clinic alone. It's kind of like if I had my magic wand, it would be this multidisciplinary clinic to sort of take care of CKD patients earlier mm. and help better manage them so that they have that time to open up, so that they have that time to to yeah. not progress, right? So, you know, I, you know, I work for a dialysis company, but I hope for no one to go on dialysis, right? That's, sure. We've gotten to that point. It's, it's not, that shouldn't be our end point, right? Our end point should be really trying to keep people off of dialysis and getting them preemptive transplants. Yeah. Absolutely. Early detection, slow down. And, and it's weird. Like, like you said, it really starts at the, almost at that primary care level, the diabetes and hypertension Huge. management. A lot of times, mm -hmm. like that, that's all I'm doing, <laughs> you know, like, you know, yeah. like hey, adjusting this and adjusting that, making sure. Mm -hmm. They're on certain medications. All right, there's, well, not enough, there's not enough nephrologists to see all the CKD three, and mm -hmm. there's, just, there's just not enough nephrologists yeah. around. I'm gonna, uh, we're rounding out the hour right now, guys. So anything you guys want to add? Um, anything you guys want to say at this point before we let, let the crowd go? I just would like to say thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. I really did appreciate having uh, this discussion. Look forward to having it further uh, and being kind of voice, you know, being a voice of the patient and being able to be um in this dialogue about you know how we can kind of better really you know like i said give patients the choice and the option to have the best modality that's going to be best for them home could be okay for, for for a lot of people but it may not be for everybody and that's okay uh and so i think it's important to just really what it comes down to is, is get people give patients choice and options to know what's in front of them which is what i didn't have the first time around and i'm glad i have it this time around <laughs> right all right, Jay. Anything? I you? just just say thank you for having us, and and I think thank you, Alex, because sometimes yeah. you know us nephrologists sit around in a room and we we talk <laughs> about the same stuff and all the things we want to do. But at the end of the day, it's it's not about us. It's it's about the patient. And so you know, I think and thanks, Costum, for making sure there is a patient. Rep I mean, like because that's that's really important. No, this just changed my mind about PD and just in general. Like it yeah. just changed my mind. Like just to get that insight. So, but yeah, um, Rayhan, go for it, man. Yeah, no, um, thanks, uh, thanks so much for uh, a great discussion today. And 
Yeah, no, this is uh, this is uh, the feedback, the conversation, and even and the questions from from the audience. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been great, a great experience, and uh, yeah, learned a lot for sure. Yeah, cool. And guys, really, I, it was awesome having you guys here. I, I've known you guys, uh, well, you guys, some of you guys for years. Some of you guys have just met. I'm just honored that you guys came on. Uh, it was a great discussion, uh, especially with Alex here. We got tons of comments in the comment section as well. I'll go through them in a little bit. I want to thank you all, all for being here. Um, again, whoever's watching, please like and share. Leave more comments if you do. And feel free to reach out to us on uh, on LinkedIn on this on here, and we can you know, maybe answer any of your questions that you have for us, okay? Um, okay. Anyway, you guys have a wonderful night, and <laughs> let's do this again sometime. Right? Sure. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.